to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 4 and verse 23, uh, where we'll begin our study today. Um, and studying down to verse 31. If you're able, stand with me. If not, you can remain seated. Follow along at the reading of God's Word, beginning in Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and said, Lord, Thou art God, who has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of Thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ, For of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto um, thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Father, we thank you for your word, for its power. We thank you for its uh, perfection. We thank you, Father, for the truth, because your word is the truth. Guide and direct our thoughts and our hearts and our minds and uh, instill within us a desire uh, to obey your calling on our life, that we would be bold as the disciples were here. Father, that we would be powerful witnesses for Jesus, the one whom we say we serve. And And truthfully and hopefully, all who call on him here today truly know him as Savior. We'll give you praise and thanks for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that, and perhaps one of the most important things that we must do as believers is to address opposition. I've called this message today, When the Church Encounters Opposition, because we're going to be opposed. We're going to be opposed. And it happened the first time Jesus' name was ever mentioned. And every time we mention it, people are going to oppose us. And they're going to do everything they can to shut us down. Truly, the name of Jesus brings a lot. Now, um, I just want to quickly go through uh, a few passages here. Nine examples in the book of Acts, uh, uh, beginning with chapter 7, of opposition to Jesus. Because, you know, Peter and John... Uh, leading the charge here in the first eight chapters up to the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, and after that, Paul, the people who served God uh, and proclaimed the name of Jesus as the Savior of the world were opposed adamantly and seriously. And so let's take a look first at chapter 9 and verse 22. 9 and verse 22. I just want you to look at the opposition and the and the sense of the opposition, so we can sort of characterize, if you will, what we're up against as really mere pittance compared to what they faced. Um, And we have the same powerful God that we serve that they serve. So we don't have any lack of, 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 of enablement to serve the Lord and be bold. Chapter 7 in Acts, excuse me, I want to go to chapter 9 and verse 20. Chapter 9 and verse 20. Over here it says, <clears throat> and straightway, that means immediately, he preached Christ in the synagogues. This is Paul. He was saved by the grace of God, knocked off the animal, and God saved him. And immediately after he was saved, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. What's serious about that? The Jews were in the synagogue and they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. 
So he knew he was going to face opposition. If you look at verse 22, it says, But Saul, and his name was later changed to Paul, increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. It says, And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to what? To kill him. We haven't gone to the point, you know, Hebrews that tell us that we have not yet suffered to the point of shedding blood. Uh, the, the apostles in the first century, they knew what it was like to shed blood. If you look at uh, chapter 13 and look at verse 44, because we're going to talk about this opposition and persecution of the church today and our message. So I want to get the sense of it as we go through the book of Acts, but I want to sort of flavor it with what they were really facing here in chapter 13 and verse 44, it says, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. You say, praise God. It says, But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas, what did they do? They grew bold. They waxed bold. We need boldness. It's really the essential ingredient of our message today, boldness. They grew bold when, they were, when, when this opposition came up, and they said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, that is to the Jews, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, as you have set thee to be, as I have set thee to be a light, of the nations that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But, you know, we don't get to the but in our lives because we're not bold enough. They waxed bold, they preached, people believed, and look what happens when you do that in verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Gone. Get rid of them. That's what the world's trying to do. If you talk about Jesus, they want you out of the picture. Look at chapter 14 in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in Iconium. These are all different places we're studying throughout this. That they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. So you see people getting saved here. In verse 2, But the unbelieving Jews, there's the but again. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected. Um, and it says, uh, against the brethren, a long time therefore abode they speaking boldly. Boldness is the key. Boldly in the Lord who gave testimony unto the word of, of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. We'll see more about that in our message today. But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when, and when uh, there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews and with the rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. That's what happens when you serve the Lord. Verse 19 in that chapter. And there, came, and there came there certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persecuted the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They thought they killed him. Nevertheless, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city. The next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. In chapter 17, look at verse 1. Go over to chapter 17 in verse 1. It says, Now when they had passed um, through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, <clears throat> uh, where, uh, there was, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, that's what he did when he went to a different city, he went unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Again, it's filled with Jews who don't believe in Jesus Christ. In verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. 
And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and the devour Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But, we're getting to the but. Do we ever get to the but in our lives? We've got to ask ourselves that question. But the Jews who believed not, moved with envy, you see that again, took unto them certain uh, base or vile fellows um, of the baser sort. These are like ones you'd find uh, the street people, if you will. Um, uh, and gathered a company and set all, this, all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come here also. If you, if you talk about Jesus, you're liable to turn the world upside down. At least the world that we live in, and the and the and the one the areas that we're involved in. So in verse seven, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Praise God for the boldness of these disciples. Uh, look at verse ten. So when the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming there went into the synagogue of the Jews, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word <clears throat> with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women who were Greeks and of men not a few. But, there's the but again, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the people. Telling you what, we're not doing it right all too often. Now, if you look at chapter 18 and look at verse 4, and this is speaking of Paul, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That's where God called him. And then take a look at verse 9 in this chapter. It says, Then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and, and hold not thy peace. There's our mantra for our witness and our testimony. Right. What does it say? Don't be afraid. Don't fear. And it says, but what? But speak and hold not thy peace. Talking about boldly speaking about Jesus and don't hold your peace. People are trying. There's, I know in Matthew 5 it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Our job is not to make peace in the world or to make peace with people. Our main thrust is to lead people to Christ, to tell people about Christ, to testify of Christ. They may know that Christ is indeed the Savior of the world. When you do that, you're not making peace. Unless they put their faith in Christ and then you've made peace with the Father and with another brother or sister in the Lord. And it says there in verse 10, For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have literally many people in the city, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And then um, if you look at verse 12 there, and when the Galileo, the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made an attack, uh, and that's literally what it is here, uh, the King James has um, an, an insurrection, but it's an attack. And who is it? Galileo was the deputy of Achaia. The Jews made an attack with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, uh, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. You know what they're trying to do in our country? Take Christ out of the schools. Take prayer out of the schools. You're not allowed to put monuments up that proclaim who God really is. You know, in our... In our, in our, our in our discussions with other people, the people that we socialize with, they don't want us to talk about Jesus and we clam up. You know what Paul and his, and his cohorts would have done? They would just get more bold about Jesus. Because it's not about making peace or keeping peace with our friends. It's not. We're actually on a mission. 
This is not our home. This is a battlefield. It's a battle. It's a spiritual battlefield. If you look at chapter 23, we've got two more to go. Look at chapter 23 and verse 11. I want to just give you the flavor for what's really going on here in the book of Acts. It says in Acts 23 and verse 11, it says, Then the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also in Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse. They made an oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. I'm talking about serious stuff here. There was a whole band of these people were not even going to eat or drink until we kill him. What did he do? He taught Jesus Christ. That's what he did. He told them who Jesus really was. Verse 13, And they were more than 40 who had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfect concerning him. And we before we come near ready to kill him. They're setting a setting up an ambush for him. One more, I told you, chapter 28 um, in Acts. And if you look at verse 17, <clears throat> we have here, Paul's now at Rome, witnessing to the Jews there. It says, and it came to pass, and this is uh, Acts 28, 17, it came to pass that after three days, three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. There was no reason to kill him. He says, But when the Jews spoke against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had really nothing here or anything, not that I had anything to accuse uh, my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Uh, that is, he's imprisoned. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spoke any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning the sect that is Christianity, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Where is it spoken against? Everywhere. It's no different today. That's why we're afraid to go speak Jesus anywhere. Because everywhere it's rebelled against. So in verse 21, and they said unto him, I mean, um, um, in verse 22, we desire to hear thee. And then in verse 23, and when they had appointed him a day, and had a court date, there came many to him unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. He taught all day long about Jesus. And, and they, they didn't like it. So in verse 24, and some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word. Well spoke the Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet unto our father saying, go unto his people and say, hearing you shall hear and shall not understand and seeing you shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is um, uh, become obtuse is the real meaning of this which says wax gross, it means dull and callous, that their heart was dull and callous, their, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great disputing here, uh, they turned against him among themselves. The resistance against teaching about Jesus is voluminous. It's everywhere. We don't have to hardly go outside the door of our house 
In fact, we don't even have to get onto the doorstep. We'll get it right in our own home. People will oppose Jesus if we teach him. Now, I just wanted to characterize what that looks like in the book of Acts because we're, this is the first persecution that we're studying here. We just finished that two-part study last week. And what we're seeing is the reaction of the two apostles, Peter and John, to that, that threat, if you will. But that's what they were. They were threatened by the highest Jewish assembly of the land, the Sanhedrin. The, the chief priests and the elders, as we go back to our text in Acts 4 and verse 23. But we, uh, we, we get it from every angle. It's everywhere. Resistance against the Lord. Um, and, uh, and, and if you just want to take a brief glance before we get into that, in Matthew 5 and verse 11, um, Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, that word persecute means to pursue you, to put you to flight, to scare you away so you won't do it anymore. Jesus talked about what happened uh, to Peter and John here in Matthew 5.11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all men of evil against you falsely for my sake. What, what does the word ha- blessed mean? Happy. Be happy. Right. To be a, to participate in the suffering of Christ. Amen. Verse 12 there says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Don't just be happy. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven. Amen. Why is your reward great in heaven? Because you proclaim Christ on this earth and some people are going to believe because you did it. Right. And it says, For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you, and they persecuted the apostles after that, and the disciples, and we're persecuted today if we really teach or preach or talk to others in the name of Jesus. Now that's just the introduction to our message. Let's go to Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. So I call this message again, when the church encounters opposition. What do we do? Well, they don't like that. They don't like that. Well... The first thing that happened, because remember, um, in verse 23 it says, and being let go, what were they let go from? Look back to verse uh, 3 in chapter 4, and we see over there that they were thrown in jail. In verse 7, they were questioned uh, after a night stay in jail because they couldn't do anything to illegal because the day had set at 6 o'clock. They had to wait till the next day at 9 o'clock to be able to conduct any business. You know, they're sticklers to the law, right? The Sanhedrin and the elders and the high priest and all of those. So in verse 7, they questioned them the next morning. Then they threatened them in verse 18. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Not even to speak the name of Jesus. There's a whole dying world that we're living in and they would love to be able to make a law that it's illegal to speak in the name of Jesus. And they're working their way there. One step at a time. One step at a time. Uh, And we know it's going to get worse and worse in the last days. And then in verse 21, when they couldn't do anything. In verse 20, it says that the, the Sanhedrin con, uh, conferred with each other and said, we cannot, bes-. I mean, that's what uh, Peter and John said, but they couldn't find anything wrong with them. They healed a man, or at least they, a man was healed because, in the name of Christ because Peter proclaimed that, that God had healed the man. They couldn't, they couldn't deny because the lame man that was healed is standing there with Peter and John in the courtroom. And guess what? There were already 8,000 people saved as we've come across so far in the book of Acts. And more people are being saved. And people are, are coming on board with Jesus and being saved by the grace of God. And there's a whole multitude of them. And they had the Sanhedrin had to worry about all those Jews. So, in verse 21, they further threatened them. And... Um, They let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. The Sanhedrin was afraid of the multitude of people. They were afraid of them. Peter and John weren't afraid of the Sanhedrin. (laughs) They weren't afraid of them at all. 
right? Paul wasn't afraid of the authorities when he was imprisoned either. So we come to the point in verse 23 that after they were threatened and threatened again, and I call this in, in verse 23 here, present the threat to the church. They were threatened. Present it to the church. That's what they did. There's a reason for presenting it to the church. There's power in prayer. James says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And when you take, your, take an issue where, the, the, where you're threatened because you're talking in the name of Jesus, take it to the church. The church then will come together in prayer and pray about it. And we're going to talk about that because the prayer uh, is given to us here. And most of what we study today will be that prayer. But in verse 23, being let go, they went to their own company. The own company is the believers. It's the church. Amen. They went back to the church. Um, and, uh, you know, literally, let's call it like-minded believers. So they being let go, they went to their own company and they reported. They told them what happened. All that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. They just reported it to the church. Second point I want to make comes in verses 24 to 29, the first part of verse 29. Praise and give thanks to God. You say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Peter and John brought it to the church and they're going to go into prayer. Well, what are they going to pray? The vast majority of their prayer is praise and thanks to God. And by the way, and I, I, and I did this little exercise. I trust that you would do it too. Go back to the book of Psalms and read all 150 of them. Read all 150 of them. Just go right on through and read them. What you'll find is in every one of those Psalms, you'll find the psalmist giving praise to God and thanks to God for who He is and what He's done. Amen. And we're going to pray. We've got to acknowledge who God is. We've got to acknowledge who He is. And oh, by the way, He is supreme he's supreme nothing is above god and everything that is was made by him and so if everything and it is since everything is made by him then there's not any task that's too difficult for him to accomplish including the little little bit of opposition that we'll get you say well my life's threatened the little bit of opposition that we get we're not the only christians to be threatened we're not the only ones that are going to be ostracized. We're not the only ones that are going to lose friends. I used to have a lot of friends when I was a young man. When I, when I got saved by the grace of God and got ordained into the ministry, uh, close friends, you can count them on one hand. Uh, and, I, and I say that. I'm not trying to, to brag about it. It's just a reality. I will say that it is extremely rare for anybody to ever say, Hey, Steve, can I come over and just sit with you for a while? People don't want to come over. They don't want to come over. They don't want to hear it. I'm going to talk about the Lord. And they know that. And so they, they try to avoid me in places because if you talk about Jesus, people aren't going to want to hang around very often. So here's what they prayed. It says here in verse 24, And when they heard that, when they heard about the threatenings by the Sanhedrin, uh, not to ever speak or teach in the name of Jesus again, and threatened additionally for that. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Now it says they. This means that those that were gathered together. We don't, we're not told how many believers were here at this point. But they came back to their own. Now, some speculate it may be the same crowd that was back in the first, in the first chapter of Acts where it was the 120 that were gathered with the apostles. About 120, 130 people. So maybe it's that crowd. Maybe it's a larger number. I believe likely it's a larger number because a lot of people have been saved. And it says that they came um, uh, and they went to their own company. And the own company just means that the people who are like-minded people of their or, or with them or following Christ and they reported all that they had done and so when they heard it they lifted up their voice that they obviously all of all of the hundred and some or thousand and some were not all speaking the same thing together at the same time I don't believe that what I do believe is Peter, who had been leading and preaching and teaching, he's the one that led the prayer. But they were, the Bible tells us they were all in one accord in verse 24. That when they heard that, when the church heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Literally, they were united in prayer Amen. with one purpose, one cause, one, uh, one thrust here, and said, 
Here's the prayer. Lord, thou art God. That's the first thing. Lord, thou art God. Boy, if we ever get our prayer life right, whew, it would be a serious matter. They say, Lord, thou art God. And then they speak about who God is. Who has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Literally, creation, creator of everything. That's who God is. Now, it says, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen or nations rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, or nations, and the peoples of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And in verse 29, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And we'll stop right there. That's their prayer. First, they point to God and say, Almighty God, You are God. Amen. You are God. You created everything. And these people of the nations, they have come. Now, who is it that actually threatened Peter and John? The highest level of authority in the Jewish nation. The highest level of authority. These were Jews. Right. Nobody is above, oh yeah, God is. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So they appeal to the authority that is above the authority that threatened. And that's what we have to do in our life. When we understand that we want to take the message of Jesus, the reason for doing that is not to offend people. We don't want to offend people, but we want to talk about Jesus. And the process of talking about Jesus will offend them. But our desire is not to offend them. Our desire is to share Jesus with them. Who He is, what He's done for me, and what He can do for you. Amen. He's the Savior of the world. And you, you're not going to go to heaven. And if you don't go to heaven, if you don't know Jesus, uh, then what's going to happen? You're going to go to hell because you haven't put your faith in Christ. That's going to offend a lot of people. It offended them from the very beginning. It offended them from the very beginning. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets. You know, even go all the way back to Noah. Preach for 120 years and zero people listen. Shouldn't, didn't stop him from preaching. <laughs> he was a preacher of righteousness, he's described in the New Testament. He preached righteousness for 120 years. <laughs> you know how people measure success today? The size of your church, the size of the crowd. That's how they measure a church. Well, I'm telling you, Noah was one of the best preachers the world ever knew. He had, he had the whole world, and every one of them rejected him. Every one of them. See, God doesn't call us and say, well, now I want you to go out and I want you to assess whether or not there's people out there that are going to receive Christ or whether you think they will or not. And then if you think they will, then go ahead and sort of ease into it. No, just come out and talk about Jesus. That's what, that's what we need to do. Just talk about Jesus. Because get right to the point. Get right to the point. And the thing is, we're not offending anybody. The name of Jesus offends them. And you know, without some conviction by the Lord, there's not going to be any salvation. Because the first step, the first step, and so who is Jesus? Jesus is the Savior of the world. Saved, saved, saved us from what? He saves us from the bondage of sin. He saves us from the sin that we committed in that bondage to Satan himself. He, he brings us out of that and delivers us. He's the Savior. So, so why would I need Jesus? Because you're in sin. Oh, see, we have to convict people of sin. Now, we can't convict them, but the one we talk about, Jesus, God will convict them of sin in their life. There's not a person that's not going to be convicted of their sin if you bring the light out there. See, we're the light of the world in Matthew chapter 5. So we need to let our light shine. Most of us have that bushel basket on our light, and so it doesn't shine. And we sort of walk around, and nobody knows. And we sort of keep it down. We share it with the person who will already know, and it's low-risk situations. Take it to the next level. Go to high-risk situations. In fact, don't even worry about the risk, because there is none. 
Because the one we serve is greater than anybody we'll come up against. And if they kill us, then they've done the Lord a service because that's God's will in our life. If we die for our testimony or witness for the Lord, that's God's will. Because God wants us to testify. Now, we don't need to be people who are just going to take and shake a fist in somebody's face and, and beat it into them. When you read through the testimony in the, in the Bible about, about believers, they all just mention it, right? I mean, if you go back to chapter 3, where we studied here in verse 19, um, in chapter 3 of Acts, uh, uh, Paul, I mean, Peter having talked about it, and go back to verse 13, um, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And he's talking to Jewish people here now. So they knew Abraham. He's the father of faith. And God of our fathers hath glorified his son Jesus. They, he talks about Jesus right away. Whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. In other words, you denied the Holy One in verse 14, who is Christ, and the just. He's the, he's the Messiah. You didn't believe it, but he is. And you desired a murder to be granted unto you. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised up from the dead. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. And that's the man who was healed, who was lame since birth, and he was 40 years old. And so he tells them in verse 19 to repent and be converted. He doesn't beat, he doesn't beat it into their heads. He just gives them the truth. And when you give people the truth, they're either going to respond usually in one or two ways. They're going to resist it, and, and who knows what they'll do when they resist it. Uh, and, and we don't care. We don't care. Because if we lose a friend for giving a testimony, praise the Lord, right? <laughs> and, and if we give a testimony and they kill us, praise the Lord. Stephen, Stephen, we're going to get to him over in, in, in chapter 7. And when Stephen the martyr, he, was, he told the Jews that the same, gave them the same message. They were stiff-necked and, and calloused hearts. And they stoned him to death. Because he preached Christ. And they said Christ was not the Messiah. It was blasphemy against God. And in that day, in that culture, blasphemy against God carried the death penalty. But he carried him outside the city, stoned him in the street. Stephen prayed for him while they're stoning him. He didn't, he didn't. He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, let me, no, 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 no. Stephen was bold in his faith. In fact, the scripture says he looked up and he saw Jesus in heaven. Amen. And that's, that's what we need to do. The source, of our, the source of our joy, the source of our life, the source of our faith, it's in heaven. It's not here on earth. We serve a risen Savior. He's not in the world today except in the lives of believers. And He, and he, indwells, he indwells us. So we go back to verse uh, 24. So they lifted up their voice. They called on Almighty God, who is sovereign above all, and said, you made heaven and earth, in verse 24, the sea, everything is in them. So in verse 25, so who by the mouth of thy servant David. Now here, Peter speaking, and he calls back on the first couple of verses from Psalm 2, which is a prophetic psalm that speaks of what's going to happen at the end of the tribulation period. And just turn back there for a second, Psalm uh, 2, and look at the first verse. Um, and it's a psalm that is, like I said, a prophecy about what's going to happen uh, at the very end of the tribulation period. And you say, well, why is Peter bringing that up? We'll, we'll, we'll see it. Psalm 2, verse 1, David wrote, uh, why, and we know it's David because we, we see it in the book of Acts. And why do the heathen or the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? This is in the face of Christ, right? In the New Testament, here in the Old Testament, we see it. So this is a prophetic message uh, that what's going to happen in the, in the tribulation period. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, that's Christ, and against his anointed, the Lord Jesus, if you will, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So it was a prophecy that the enemy which is the, the leaders of nations, is going to be destroyed at the end of the revelation, at the end of the tribulation period, because Jesus is going to come back and he's going to set up his kingdom, the millennial kingdom, prophesied in Psalm 2. So we go back to our text. So they heard that, they lifted up their voice with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God who's made. And then he talked about 
this prophecy, which continues in verse 26, the kings of the earth stood up and rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the nations, the, the Gentiles there, and the people of Israel were gathered together. Well, so the, the, prophes, the prophecy from Psalm 2 uh, sort of ends at the beginning of verse 27 or at the end of verse 26, and then Peter begins to apply that prophecy to what's happening at that time as we're studying the book of Acts, right after the day of Pentecost, and he'd preach those couple of sermons. And so this wasn't the fulfillment of the prophecy. This is a partial fulfillment of the prophecy. Peter saw what was going to happen at the end of the tribulation period, sort of coming now. At the end of the tribulation period, Christ is going to destroy all of the people that oppose him, and all of the leaders of the nation will be gone. Peter's facing that opposition now. And Peter understands who's in control. Now, you've got to understand the context here. Peter has been threatened by the highest level of authority among the Jews. And so the highest level of authority period on earth, Jesus came back to destroy in order to set up his kingdom. In fact, if you look over at the book of Revelation, we'll just turn there for a second. Uh, you may be interested in it. Uh, we're not going to do uh, an in-depth study, but we're going to talk about that passage just briefly uh, in Psalm 2, if you will. But in Revelation chapter 17, if you look at verse 9, uh, and this is the end of the tribulation period, if you will, it says in verse 9 there, and here, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Interpretation of the, uh, pair of, the, of the information here. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings, so about seven leaders, uh, here, seven kings, these are the kings of the world, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he um, is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns, the ten world leaders, which thou sawest, are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast." These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They all serve the beast. Verse 14, these shall make war with the lamb. That's Christ, the lamb of God. World leaders at that time are going to make war with Christ because he's coming to set his kingdom up. And the lamb shall overcome them. Why? For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And we're going to be with him. <laughs> now, if you peek over at Revelation 19, um, for uh, in verse 11, <clears throat> it says over there, as uh, John, the Apostle John, continues his revelation from the Lord here, he said, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no, na no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John chapter 1 tells us that the Word was made uh, flesh. And the armies and the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his uh, thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And here in verse 17, it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper for the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and literally enslaved here, if you will, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth um, and their armies gathered together. This is the final battle. All of the world leaders, all of their armies, everything the world's got, they're going to throw it at Lord. <laughs> 
And they gathered together to make war against him, and they sat on the horse against his army, against Christ's army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he delivered them that had received the mark of the beast, them that worked his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That same lake of fire, by the way, is where all unbelievers will go when they are judged at the end. And in verse 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him and sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Uh, And so we go back to our text in Acts chapter 4 and verses 25 to 27, and we see Peter pulling together this prophecy of Almighty God who's going to be totally victorious at the end and overcome every ounce of opposition and destroy it all. It's just going to, it's like no contest. Boom! And it's gone. And Peter's saying, this is the opposition we're facing today. The same opposition that's going to come up against the Lord. And the Lord is the one who can destroy all of that. All world powers are going to come up against the Lamb. So in verse uh, 27 of Acts 4, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. So he now pulls the the prophecy of the end times into the present situation. And he talks about Jesus. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. And he talks about Herod and Pontius Pilate. So we know he's bringing it right to the present scene. Both Herod, Herod, who was he? He was the Tetrarch. Head of, Tetrarch means the fourth part. Head of the fourth part of the kingdom at that point. And Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judah, with the nations, the Gentiles there, and the people of Israel were gathered together. We read gathered together. That's what the nations did. They're the exact words used in the book of Revelation and that um, passage we just read over there in chapter 21. <clears throat> and this gathered together uh, was that originally used for gathering a harvest. For gathering a harvest. You can see that in their prophecy in Revelation, it was like Christ gathering all that stuff, right? But um, it was used for gathering powerful groups in this day uh, that were determined to put Jesus to death. Uh, the Pharisees did it in John 11, the chief priest. Jesus, um, uh, the, the, the Pharisees gathered together in, in John 11. The, the chief priest gathered together. The same phrase is used in Matthew 26. Uh, the band of soldiers against Jesus as he was uh, being taken to the cross. That term was used, gathered together against him. Um, and it's in, in employed for the gathering together of the kings of the earth by demons at the end of the age, as we had read there. And that's also found in Revelation 16. So we have, we have Peter bringing that prophecy of Psalm 2 given by David, and that's why he says here in verse 25, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did they rage? They hated Jesus. Um, And the kings, amen brother, stood up and the rulers gathered together against the Lord. Is it going to be successful? No. And then he brings it down and says, they actually have, they, the they, the rulers and the powers are Herod and Pontius Pilate of the highest there. They're even above the Sanhedrin in the land, not among the Jewish nation. And so Peter says in verse 27, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the nations and the people of Israel, were gathered together. At that time, it was a partial fulfillment of what was going to happen at the end times. So in verse 28, What were they going to do? Whatever God's counsel determined beforehand to be done. The crucifixion and the death of Christ, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension in heaven were all foretold in Scripture and it came to pass as God had determined. Something had to happen for all that to take place. And it was this opposition that was growing and growing and growing. And Peter pointed to the fact that this is the opposition that took place that took and made it possible for Jesus to pay the price of your sins. Remember, Peter preached that sermon just in chapter 3 and said, you are the people, the Jewish people, you're the people who killed him and crucified him. You're the people that did it. So now it's becoming very personal, if you will. And this comes out in the prayer of these Jews that have, that have believed. 
And so in the beginning of verse 29, and now, Lord, Peter says, and the crowd says, this is their prayer. Now they get to their request. So I call this part, petition God for help. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Take notice of it. As if God's not noticing. But you know, God wants us to have a conversation with Him. And so part of the conversation is, Lord, acknowledge the fact that, we're, that we know that He's hearing. And, and, and so look what they're doing, Lord. Behold their threatenings. And what is their request for action? Grant unto thy servants two things. Boldness. Uh, that they may speak thy word. Remember, they were told not to ever teach or preach in the name of Jesus again. They went together in prayer and called upon the God of glory, the God who will be victorious over every world situation and leader and establish his own kingdom and righteousness. And he says here, he says, behold, their threatenings grant boldness that we can speak Jesus and teach in his name. And so in verse 30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Why are they asking for um, uh, wonders here? Signs and wonders, the healing of the lame man. Remember, in the midst of the courtroom was the lame man that was healed. It was the healing of the lame man whereby Jesus was proclaimed to be the healer by Peter and John. And now they're calling upon that name Jesus. But because they were teaching in the name of Jesus, that's why they were being threatened, if you will. So now they come full circle and they say, give us, Lord, the ability, the enablement to heal through your power. Put us in those situations where people can be healed and, if you will, where we can speak boldly and, if you will, where wonders may be done of thy holy child done by the name of Jesus. By the name of Jesus. They wanted, in essence, what they wanted is more opportunities to do what just got them in deep trouble. So they could do the same thing again. We got the wrong perspective sometime on witnessing and testifying for the Lord. We think it's just about a little conversation here and there. It's a much bigger picture. Look how Peter drew in a prophecy of David to bring in the victorious power of God over everything. God's allowing things to happen now. They're going to be destroyed in the end. And boy, will they ever be destroyed. But there's coming a day when evil will never, no longer ever be present. In heaven, there'll be no more pain, no sorrow, no evil, no wickedness. Nothing but perfectness. Nothing but perfectness. But until then, we're living in a dying world. And God has put His people on earth to testify so others would believe. We don't know who they are. And if we fail to act boldly in our witness, we might not ever know who some of the ones are that are actually in our group of acquaintances or the ones we'll come to meet. So in verse 31, I call this uh, <clears throat> here, uh, place confidence in God's enablement. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now they, this isn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They already had that on the day of Pentecost. This is the strengthening by the Holy Spirit, the enabling power of God that comes through the enablement of the Holy Spirit came upon them to full strength and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Amen. And I'm telling you what, if you don't get that, you don't get it. They came back to the church and they, and they prayed that they would have the boldness to keep being bold for the Lord. Despite the threatenings on their life. And oh, it got worse. It got worse after that. We saw, we saw that this doesn't stop it. We went, that's why I went through those nine examples in the book of Acts where the threats continued, continued, continued. <clears throat> and it's not going to end until the Lord destroys all evil and wickedness in this world. And we took a peek of that over in the book of Revelation. We're threatened. We're threatened all the time. A lot of the threats we don't perceive as threats. But when they, when they tell us we can't take a Bible to work, that's a threat to our Christianity. Take it as a threat. 
That's what we fail to do. We just say, well, you know, it's a little thing. You know, not a big deal that I can't take my Bible to church. It's just the devil and his demons are pecking away one thing at a time. It's prayer in the schools. It's Bibles at work. Who knows where it'll be next? What we do know is they've got enough of the weakening of, of people so that now uh, we see the, 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 at least our nation reverting to perversion and wickedness openly. They're putting it into law. Uh, you know, and, and I understand people say, we got a great victory in Roe Ro v. Wade being cast out. Well, we didn't. We didn't. True believers will understand there's no victory in that. Because the bet that what they did is they turned it over to the states to determine what to do about abortion. At best, the best state of the 50 states we have says let you can kill the baby up to 15 weeks. That's still abortion, folks. It's still abortion. And between, between now and the next time it gets to a serious discussion about when to do that, there's going to be enough pressure to move it to 15 weeks, to 20 weeks. And before you know it, we'll have euth euthanasia even after birth. We'll have you know, people that are seniors, you know, people that are not valued in society, not worthwhile, not profitable to society, and they'll just kill them off. And it, we're coming to the point where evil is prevailing and the people who are wicked being led by Satan and his demons, they are becoming more successful at being wicked. Yeah. And that's what Paul, Paul meant when he wrote to Timothy and says that it will wax worse and worse. It means that those wicked people will be more proficient and more efficient and more successful in, be, in, in driving people to evil and wickedness and perversion. And we're seeing it right before our eyes. Uh, we were talking just last Wednesday night how that just two years ago, a lot of the stuff we're seeing that's happening in the schools and, and, and the things about the transgenders and the, the, the transsexuality and, and the openness and the proliferation of, of gays and lesbians. And now it's promoted and we got this gay pride thing. I think it was um, uh, George who told me that at the at the truck plant that they have this trophy not a trophy but a, they have this thing when you enter the plant and it's a pride it's a pride I don't know what you want to call it emblem or whatever and on there and it promotes homosexuality and all that stuff because if if the big business of the world don't address this they'll shut them down they'll shut them, they'll stop buying from them there's enough pressure enough money to do that so the big companies are having to follow along and follow along. I mean, yep. uh, I got out at HR when they started having to give, um, and it was one of the reasons to get out of HR, when they started making it possible, matter of fact, they made it, made it law, uh, a law that businesses had to grant benefits to homosexual partners. I couldn't handle any more. I mean, I, and benefits are under my purview in a human resources. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I'm not going to be a part of that. And I'm not going to promote it, and I'm not going to handle it and make it look like... So I'm just not going to... And, and there's not an environment to work in. And we're getting to the point where I don't know where we go, but one thing I know for sure, we keep talking about Jesus. We go to the Lord in prayer, proclaim who He is, praise Him for who He is, thank Him for, for what He's done and what He will do, and then make our petitions known. Not selfish petitions, but the disciples wanted to hear, prayed that we'd be able to continue to do the same thing they were doing. Notice one thing absent in the prayer. And we'll close with that. What's absent in the prayer? Deliverance. They never asked to be delivered from the persecution. We want to get out of the fire. We don't want to get into the fire. If we get into it, we want to get out. Lord, make peace around me. Or, you know, please, only when people get saved is there really going to be peace. That's right. Because peace doesn't come from circumstances or world conditions. Peace comes from the Lord. And it comes through faith in Christ. That's the only way we can have peace. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to trying to get delivered. We want to we want to do some things, but we don't do them because the world's against us everywhere. We saw it 
back in the first century. We just read about it. It's everywhere. Everybody's against the church. Everybody's against, not the church, the church I'm speaking of is the body of born again believers. Of all born again believers. Because no, no other organization is the church. They put church on the side of their building, but it's only a true church if it's got born again believers that are worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth. So we need to be of a mindset that we're going to, that we're going to, like the disciples here, we want to continue to teach and preach the name of Jesus. That's the issue. We see that's the issue all the way through the book of Acts. That's what purpose I went there. Teach and preach in the name of Jesus. Tell others about Jesus. That's our mission on this earth. Every believer's mission is to talk about Jesus. It's the very basic uh, requirement that we have. Basic requirement. And if we don't do that, we're not fulfilling the very essence of what God wants us to do. Amen. To be the light. How can we be the light of the world? Because the light is Christ. And if we don't tell people about Christ, how do they know we're the light? We've got to tell them. Because there's not going to be a shining beam coming off our forehead or out of our ears. The people, way people know that the light is because what is light? Light is representative of righteousness. Because we have God's righteousness put on our account. And we're going to speak in a righteous manner. And we're going to strive to seek others that through, through faith in Christ, they'll be able to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Wherever we go, talk about Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer by standing, if you will. Father, we're thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace. We're thankful for giving to us this message today for encouraging our hearts and emboldening us <clears throat> that we might go forward with the same determination as those we've studied today. That truly, as, as your children, as your called out ones, Father, that we will serve your purpose in this dying world. Not commit to self-preservation or self-enjoyment or self-pleasure. But that everything we do is for you and never for us. And that what we do will bring you joy, bring you happiness. Lord, it will please you, satisfy your holy requirements. And Father, we just pray that we'll be those vessels of honor through which you can work to reach out to others simply in the name of Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks and praise for that. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.